everyone. I'm Shweta Mishra and I welcome you all to this PCOS and nutrition session on Keotox in association with PCOS Tracker app, more information about which is available on its website pcostracker.app. Today on this show, we are talking about managing PCOS symptoms, specifically using supplements and diet modifications. And I'm beyond excited to welcome our eminent guest expert, registered dietitian, Angela Grassi, who is a PCOS survivor herself and an internationally known PCOS nutrition expert and author of the PCOS workbook. A recipient of numerous awards, Angela is the founder of the PCOS Nutrition Center, provides evidence-based nutrition information and coaching to women with PCOS. Welcome to Cure Talks, Angela. Uh, it's my pleasure to have you here with us today and thank you for finding time. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. On the panel to guide the discussion, we have PCOS patient advocate, Lisa Rosenthal from Reproductive Medicine Associates of Connecticut. Welcome to the show, Lisa. Thank you for joining the panel with me and co-hosting with me today. My honor to be here. Thank you. So Angela, um, we have an overwhelming response for this talk and we have a lot of women in the audience excited to learn about everything um, about supplements that can help improve the variety of PCOS symptoms that we experience, some of which affect our daily lives. So I'll begin with the most common question coming in from the listeners, uh, and that is about irregular periods. Um, we have received several questions asking, what are the best supplements for regulating periods, re um, naturally resuming ovulation and improving fertility? Sure. So irregular periods are in PCOS are very common and it's mostly due in part to the hormone imbalance. So people with PCOS tend to have higher levels of insulin, higher levels of testosterone, and that affects the other female sex hormones that control our menstrual cycle, like luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. And there's so much we still need to learn about PCOS and menstrual irregularity, but one supplement in particular that we find to be very helpful is inositol. Inositol, both myo and dpyro inositol in a 40 to one ratio, um, I find helps the majority of my patients regulate their cycle within three months. Okay. Yeah, inositol is a really good one. Um, other supplements that can be helpful is vitamin D because vitamin D can help bring down testosterone. And it's also a hormone. I'm sure we'll be talking lots about vitamin D. And uh, fish oil as well can help regulate menstrual cycles. Okay, so for uh, inositol specifically, do you, um, would you like to recommend a dosage or something like how, what is the frequency in which it, is, it should be taken? Sure, so inositol, there's two main types. Like I mentioned, there's myo inositol and there's d inositol. Mm -hmm. And according to the research, um, the majority of the research shows that taking 2000 milligrams of myo and 50 milligrams of d inositol twice a day, so spread out. So you take 2000 of myo and 50 milligrams of d with breakfast, and then again, doing it with dinner. It works best if you spread them out and um, take them with food. And so this is the 41 ratio that I mentioned. Okay, all right, thank you for that answer. Um, uh, so based on your experiences uh, with supplements and diet modifications, if any, have you found that are most effective in reducing extra growth hair, you know, related to PCOS? Yeah, that extra hair growth is not yeah. fun. <laughs> and it's usually related to higher testosterone levels. And so supplements that we know can help bring down testosterone is gonna be zinc. Zinc uh, can actually inhibit testosterone from converting to its active form DHT. So zinc starting with maybe 30 milligrams a day uh, taken with food, cause it can irritate the stomach and trying that. And um, what I recommend to patients is take a picture like once a month. Like at the beginning of the month, there are certain dates and take a picture of your problem area, whether it's hair loss or acne or the extra hair growth. And then if you try a supplement, maybe a month later, take another picture and compare the difference. So you can see if it's really working, if you need to try a higher dose um, and certainly working with a professional can really help to guide on the ideal supplement dosage. Um, but starting with about 30 milligrams of zinc can help bring down testosterone 
We also know that uh, fish oil, uh, those omega-3s are great at bringing down testosterone too. Um, and that's bringing down inflammation too. So that can be really helpful for extra hair growth. And then in general, um, for nutrition, we always recommend a uh, nutritious eating plan. So that includes those omega-3s, whether it's from fish and avocado and nuts and seeds. Okay. And uh, we also recommend eating high fiber rich foods. So whole grains, fruits, vegetables, beans, all can be good for PCOS. Sure, thank you. Um, uh, so how does N-acetylcysteine act to relieve PCOS symptoms and are there any contraindications that we should be aware of when planning to use this supplement? Sure, so N-acetylcysteine is also known as NAC. This is an amino acid. It's also a antioxidant and it's a, um, really helpful in PCOS. We have some pretty good data on its usage. It has been shown to reduce insulin and cholesterol and help improve egg quality. And it's even been compared with metformin. So we do have a systematic review uh, looking at randomized controlled trials that compared NAC to metformin and it performed equally as well for improving insulin. It also uh, brought down cholesterol like metformin did equally as well, if not a little bit better for the N-acetylcysteine. Uh, so NAC, the average dose that was used in the studies was 1.9 milligrams to three grams a day. And there are some contraindications with NAC. Um, it should be taken in people who take blood thinners or certain blood pressure medications. So it's really important to talk to your doctor first, especially if you're taking any of those medications. Right. That is very helpful. Thank you. Um, I think with that, I will now invite Lisa um, to ask her questions. Uh, a brief introduction about Lisa. Uh, motivated by her personal infertility journey, Lisa is uh, determined to help others undergoing fertility treatment, and she has over 30 years of experience in the fertility field, including her work at um, Resolve and Reproductive Medicine Associates of Connecticut. She's also a certified grief recovery specialist and teacher and founder of the Fertile Yoga program designed to support men and women on their quest for their families. Lisa, I invite you to ask your questions. Please take over. Thank you, Shweta. These were questions that uh, I collected from patients, but I can't, I can't go on without asking Angela one question. Metformin can be really, as I know, because I take it, can be really, really challenging for your, your Rest, you know, your digestive system, I can be very challenging. What, how does that, how does that compare to the neck? Ah, so metformin um, and neck. So they both were formed equally as well for bringing down insulin and glucose and cholesterol. Okay. According to the studies that have been compared the two. Now we have a lot more data on metformin for helping PCOS, but as you mentioned, it can be really difficult. Does the NAC also have some of the side effects that metformin does, or does it not have those kind of side effects? NAC generally is really well tolerated. So That's it's not like, yeah. yeah, it doesn't cause the GI, but they do work maybe a little bit differently. So, um, you know, some people really benefit from both. You can take both together. Um, some people might find metformin more helpful depending how insulin resistant they are. Excellent, thank you so much. So one of the questions that I got was, how can I tell if my feelings of depression are due to PCOS? And if they are, what are the best supplements to take for it? Yeah, you know, um, there are emerging research that shows anxiety and depression are pretty prevalent in the PCOS population. And the new evidence-based guidelines actually recommend that we screen all patients for PCOS for depression and anxiety, as well as eating disorders. So um, that's how important it is and how common. And we don't know if it's uh, PCOS related. The, certainly living with PCOS, I have PCOS is very difficult. Um, there's a lot of challenges that maybe someone with PCOS who doesn't have PCOS doesn't have to experience. Uh, so we don't know if it's necessarily related to PCOS or is it because of other factors. 
Um, but regardless, if you feel like uh, you do have depression, um, there are some supplements that can help. Uh, magnesium can be really helpful, especially if you have the anxiety part of the mental health as well. We see fish oil can actually help improve some depression symptoms and vitamin D. So vitamin D is a vitamin. It's also a hormone and it has been shown to play a role in mood. And if you think of some people get that sad, the, um, seasonal affective disorder in the winter, because they're not out in the sun, you know, they get more down and perhaps some people like me, I'm happier when it's nicer out. Um, and it could be related to the vitamin D. So that's definitely one, but um, we actually, uh, myself and a psychologist, Dr. Stephanie Mate, we actually wrote a workbook called the PCOS workbook, your guide to complete physical and emotional health. And we have a whole chapter on mood and recognizing depressive symptoms and anxiety symptoms and some coping skills. Uh, so that, that actually has been proven to reduce anxiety and depression in PCOS. There's a published case study on it. Uh, but regardless, if you do find that you're struggling with depression, I would certainly encourage you to reach out for help with a mental health expert. And so many uh, professionals now are doing sessions over Zoom, telehealth sessions. So um, it's really, really beneficial. I know some people are like, oh, therapy, yeah, you know, it's not for me, but it can be really beneficial. Maybe just a few sessions even to try it out. I love that. Really great suggestions. Thank you. Um, another patient wrote to me and I quote, I can't afford the kind of healthcare that I need for PCOS. Everything's out of pocket. What do I do? Including the supplements because they're no medication. They're not medication. No insurance covers them. And she writes help with an exclamation point. Uh, you know? I know. Uh, and really good quality supplements are expensive. Insurance doesn't really cover them. If somebody has a flex savings account or health savings account, you can actually use that money for supplements as well as nutrition counseling with a dietitian. So uh, maybe some listeners didn't know that, but if you have a health savings plan, you can use that money. Um, and there's so many different supplements and we're going to talk more about the different types of supplements, but not everybody needs every supplement. Um, it really depends on maybe some key ones. If you're trying to get pregnant, inositols are a really great one to spend the money on. Um, if you're low in vitamin D, you can actually get a prescription for that. You can ask your doctor and insurance will cover vitamin D if you're low. Um, other ways, I mean, for fish oil, you can always really increase your intake of omega-3. So eating fish, uh, eating seafood, eating uh, avocados, avocado oil, nuts and seeds. These are all great forms of omega-3 so you can get through food. Well, I'm glad I'm here because I'm learning so much already. Thank you. So another uh, one of our patients said, you know, one, one expert says to take one thing. Another says something entirely different. How do I know who to trust? Yeah. And that's something that really bothers me. And one of the reasons I founded the PCOS Nutrition Center was to provide evidence-based information uh, to people with PCOS. Uh, and I'm not just going to give you my opinion. I'm going to tell you what the research is showing. I'm not going to tell you what supplements working for me, but what the research shows and what ranges. And um, I think it's important to look at that. I think there's a lot of experts out there that have PCOS and because something worked for them, a certain tea, a certain vitamin, a certain uh, elimination of a food group, that that's how everybody with PCOS should eat. And we do know there's at least four different phenotypes uh, of PCOS. So everybody is different and it's important to individualize recommendations. There's not a one size fits all for every single person with PCOS. What you need, Lisa, is probably, you know, different from what I need. Uh, so it's really important that we look at what the evidence is that's being presented, that we be objective when we see some evidence out there. Who is this person giving information? I would be weary of anyone recommending um, one certain product if it's uh, elimination of a complete food group um, and those kind of recommendations. And, and certainly looking at their credentials too. Are they qualified? Are they registered dietitians? Do they have experience treating PCOS? Excellent. Thank you so much. Again, so helpful. Um, and it's nice to hear that, you know, just by getting a prescription for vitamin D that can make a difference for people. 
So this was a very specific question. I hope I pronounced it correct, correctly. She, uh, a friend and patient had a question about berberine. And she, what she said was, I've always researched different supplements to see what could help with PCOS and my struggles with it. And I, recently I heard about this. Is it something that might be considered more reliable and effective than metformin? Right, so here's a situation where you hear something on the internet um, right. and you pronounce it right, Lisa, it is berberine. Berberine is a Chinese herb and it has been shown to be useful for decades for helping people with type 2 diabetes. Uh, berberine is pretty potent. I kind of compare it to metformin, although it doesn't have the side effects of metformin. Um, berberine works to improve insulin sensitivity. That's one of the big benefits of it. It, it can help bring down insulin. It's great for lowering cholesterol. If you have high cholesterol or improving fatty liver, which is pretty common in PCOS as well. Uh, there has been a study that compared berberine and metformin, and um, they also looked at it versus a placebo too. And the berberine group actually improved insulin just as well as metformin. It also reduced glucose. Uh, it improved testosterone a little bit, but it, I think it was only a three month study. And this is part of the problem with PCOS is we don't have long-term studies. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have a lot of funding for PCOS. The NIH uh, a lot, very, very little compared to other even female conditions for PCOS research. And if we don't have enough funding, the researchers can't do really good studies. So, um, but I can tell you some people find berberine to be very helpful and you can take it with metformin. Of course, talk to your doctor if you're gonna use any supplement um, or you know, some people that just can't tolerate metformin and aren't taking metformin, they could try uh, perhaps berberine as an alternative. Wonderful. I was, I was wondering how that, that was going to go. Um, can you help us understand briefly how better to read and understand nutrition labels or packaging of stu supplements? Like for instance, if I go to where, you know, the health food store and I look and I see three supplements and they, they all have, they all say the same thing. Vitamin D, for instance, what makes one better, what make, because the FDA doesn't approve any of them, doesn't look at any of them, correct? So how, correct. Can, I tell, how can I tell the difference? Right, so you bring up an excellent point, Lisa, that everyone should be aware of, is that the FDA doesn't regulate supplements like they do drugs. Like we even saw for like the COVID vaccine, they had to do all this testing first and show the evidence before they allowed the US to use it. Um, supplements uh, don't have to go through that. You can literally put something in a bottle and put it on the store shelf or sell it on the internet. Mm -hmm. that's, that's scary. So what happens, it's very scary. And what we hear is some supplements don't have what it says on the label. We've heard of cases where they found like broken glass in a bottle or, you know, paper clips or, you know, just all kinds of stuff. So it's really important to ideally look to see if the product has been third party tested. So that means an independent lab, it's sent to an independent lab and they analyze it to see if it's got what's in it. And then some companies like the PCOS Nutrition Center that I run, we go an extra step. We get it certified. Um, so by there's two main organizations, there's NSF, and there's USP and you can have, it's like another independent lab and they do more thorough testing for purity and accuracy. And they have a whole database once they approve a supplement that you can look it up. So looking for those um, are really important. Those symbols will be on the label if it has USP or NSF certified. I, that, I, that is so helpful. That really is. I'm so delighted to hear that. Um, so, Now's my opportunity to just talk a little bit about um, Madison, who was diagnosed with PCOS in 2019. Um, after years of ignoring her symptoms, been there, done that. She started experiencing severe mood swings in 2014 and started gradually noticing other challenging symptoms common to PCOS, like extra hair, acne, weight gain, depressions, and irregular periods. She's grateful that she was diagnosed and she looks forward to making necessary life changes. And her questions are, 
you know, what are natural ways to lower testosterone? That, that was her first question. So um, different forms, it depends how high it is, but zinc again, really good at bringing down testosterone because it inhibits testosterone from converting to its active form. Mm -hmm. um, also looking at inositols, they can help bring down testosterone. We see vitamin D can help with testosterone lowering. And we also see that omega-3s or fish oil really helpful to do that too. It's wonderful that those things are, are helping on multiple levels. I like, that's wonderful. So she cur currently reports that she's taking Avastatol and she asks, have you heard of it? Which clearly you have. And what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, so, so Avastatol is actually an inositol supplement that has that 40 to one ratio of Mayo to Dechiro that I talked about at the beginning. Um, and it's a powder, which I really like. And just to, for transparency, we do sell Ovacetol at the PCOS Nutrition Center. Ovacetol is NSF certified. So okay. it's been taken that extra step. You know what's in it is pure inositol. And it's nice being in a powder form. It's a tasteless powder. I take it myself. Um, and it's nice because so many people at PCOS are taking handfuls of supplements and medications and one less thing to swallow, uh, down with the pill is kind of nice. Yeah. So do you put it in like a, a cup of a glass of water or a cup of tea or something? Is that what you do with it? Yeah. You can put Ovacetol in cold liquids. You can put it in warm coffee, um, really anything except maybe alcohol or maybe carbonated beverages because it might fizz, but I love it in just water. Again, it's pretty tasteless or unsweetened iced tea. Excellent. Um, what is the main challenge you find with P that women with PCOS face? I mean, I, that's a big, broad question. Yeah. <laughs> I would say the number one is struggles with their weight that they've gain weight uncontrollably and then they go to the doctor and the doctor just tells them just lose weight and do a crazy diet to do so. And uh, it's, it's really frustrating and it's really frustrating to hear that advice. Uh, yeah, th there's nothing less helpful, honestly, than some, than a doctor saying, well, eat less and exercise more. What, what does that actually do to somebody who has insulin resistance with PCOS? If, if that was the advice they followed, I mean, I guess my question, my follow-up question is, and I hope it's okay, Shwita, is, is some of this advice actually the opposite of helpful? Does it, can it actually exacerbate some of the problems that we have with PCOS? Very true. And again, we don't have a lot of long-term data at all about different diets for PCOS. We really don't. Uh, the longest nutrition study we have was a year and it involved a low GI diet approach and it it did improve insulin sensitivity, even without much weight loss. We know that nutrition changes, like improving the quality, the nutrition quality of what you eat can help improve your insulin, that taking certain supplements like inositol or the NAC that we talked about, or berberine can actually help bring down insulin too. Um, what's really problematic is we're, you know, doctors are taught do no harm and we talked about the higher prevalence of depression and anxiety and eating disorders in PCOS. If a doctor or a healthcare professional says, you know, do this one diet, especially if it's very restrictive, like a keto diet, um, an Atkins style diet or something like that, or even gluten-free diets, it's very difficult to follow. Um, somebody might start doing it, see some results as far as weight loss, and it's very hard to follow long-term. <laughs> So oftentimes um, it's not uncommon for people to start binging and engage in binge eating. And that's how we see eating disorders develop. And that's going to worsen insulin resistance in the long run, as well as mental health. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's very frustrating that the doctors don't seem to know, you know, some doctors do, but it's the lack of information is challenging. So that's her, um, Madison's last question is great, which are what are the main foods you would diet, you would incorporate into a PCOS friendly diet? And I would even go further to say like, do you have like, I know there's no magic foods, but your favorite foods, you know, things that you really like to see somebody with PCOS eating. 
Sure. So we know that food can help heal PCOS. Um, can't reverse it or, you know, I shouldn't say totally heal it, but you can improve your labs. You can get your labs at normal ranges. You can get your cycle regulated and good nutrition can help with that. And that really comes down to antioxidants. That is what we get from fruits and vegetables. Um, the whole grains, um, Things like the omega-3s that we talked about. Fish is great for PCOS and seafood. Um, we see that incorporating other omega-3s like olive oil and avocados, um, lots of prebiotics like onions and garlic are really good for us. So it's really, um, some people say like the Mediterranean approach because they eat a lot of omega-3s and fruits and vegetables that that's really great for improving insulin resistance and helping to improve fertility. So I have one more question, Shweta, sure. and that, thank you. You're being very kind. Um, how important is it to eat, have organic foods? Mm. Correct. So according to a, a large research study, we have seen one, <laughs> it compared organic foods to conventional foods as far as fertility. And we find that they are the same nutrient wise, like an organic apple is the same nutrients as a non-organic apple. But we do see from this one study that fertility was better in the organic. Excellent. Organic Thank food. You. All right, thank you, thank you, Lisa. Great questions, a um, lot of information, Angela, thanks. Um, I think while we are talking about foods, right? So we, we should take up some questions that came in from our listeners um, related to food. So uh, we have a couple of questions on gluten and dairy. So um, one of them asks, is fasting or going gluten or dairy free go good for PCOS? And um, the other one that again asks about dairy is that what are your suggestions on dairy consumption? Sure. So I think one of the most confusing recommendations out there is gluten-free diets for PCOS. I don't know where they came from. We don't have a single study that has looked at gluten-free diets in PCOS. I'm not going to say that that doesn't work because for some people, they feel a lot better if they cut out gluten. And those are going to be people that maybe have an intolerance or a sensitivity or maybe have celiac disease, which is an autoimmune condition. Yeah, which is undiagnosed, um, right? They may have an undiagnosed condition, which exactly, is not bad Exactly. So when they cut out gluten, they're going to feel better, right? Their inflammatory markers are going to come down. They can lose weight easier, right. maybe. Uh, I would say the majority of people aren't going to respond that way with PCOS from what we're seeing. Uh, Gluten-free diets are very difficult to follow. Uh, they're usually lacking in a lot of vitamins and minerals um, and fiber. So I usually don't recommend them unless I'm working with a client and we're seeing some digestive issues. We also have to consider that uh, people that have irritable bowel syndrome uh, might have more trouble digesting gluten. Gluten is what we call a FODMAPS food, which is an acronym for foods that are basically difficult for some people to digest. Okay. So again, maybe somebody has IBS and they cut back on gluten and one of those foods tends to be something that would be difficult for them to digest and they're gonna feel better and the bloating's gonna be down. Um, but there's no evidence and it's really frustrating that even some experts are recommending gluten-free diets because I think it's unethical. I think it's irresponsible to say everybody needs to eat gluten-free. Um, as far as fasting, uh, the data is pretty limited on that. And there's different forms of fasting. I would never recommend going days on end without eating. Um, some people find that if they stop eating after dinner and they don't eat till breakfast, that's actually considered a fast. So if somebody stops eating at six o'clock at night and they don't eat until 6 a.m., that's a 12 hour fast technically. Right. Um, I always work with my clients to listen to their bodies if they're hungry and it's the evening, they might need to eat right. um, and to experiment if they're not hungry, what that's like for them in the morning, if they don't eat late at night, how that impacts their hunger levels or how they sleep even. 
And as far as dairy, that's another controversial topic with PCOS. It's got a lot of controversy. We hardly have any studies on PCOS and dairy. Um, we do have a couple studies that show that dairy, but in particular, fat-free milk and fat-free yogurt can contribute to acne production and can increase testosterone and can increase insulin. Um, fat-free milk and yogurt, when you take the fat out of milk, you change the hormone composition of it. Okay. So um, fat norm normally milk has fat in it. So when you make it fat free, you're taking the fat out and you're left with higher androgens in the milk. And that can actually increase your blood androgen levels and your insulin and contribute to acne. We didn't see it so much with um, full fat dairy. Didn't seem to do it as much. And we didn't see it with cheese. And cheese is actually considered a low glycemic index food because it has protein in it and it doesn't really have carbs. So I think we need to look at it in context. Um, I think we have to individualize it. If somebody is struggling with acne, they might want to play around with either switching to full fat dairy or cutting out milk and yogurt and seeing how their acne is. Um, and taking it from there. Right, right. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, right. Um, so uh, we have one question asking, should typical PCOS and lean PCOS be treated the same, Angela? Good question. So when we uh, refer to lean PCOS, we're talking about um, thin women with PCOS. And uh, Again, everybody's gonna be different and have different recommendations. If someone's struggling with infertility, the guidelines are still gonna be the same. Vitamin D can still really help with fertility. Low glycemic index foods, regardless, are gonna help. Uh, we're still seeing that what, no matter what your weight is, that you still have an insulin issue. Right. And uh, we do see that in the data when we compare women with PCOS to women without PCOS, all different ranges of weights, we do see that even lean women with PCOS have higher insulin levels and higher inflammatory markers than somebody without PCOS. So the same recommendations pretty much do apply. Um, focusing on those antioxidants, getting in omega-3s, getting in fiber, uh, the vitamin D can be really helpful and inositol can be really helpful too. Right, okay, thank you. Um, I think um, uh, one of the symptoms that we have not discussed so far is acne, right? And we have a couple of questions, a few questions on hormonal acne. So how to regulate periods naturally as well as hormonal acne? So if you can answer that. Sure. So um, inositols are great for helping to regulate periods, um, like the avocetol that we talked about. And I'd say 90% of my patients can get their cycle back in three months from taking it regularly. It's that good. It's hard to believe, but it's that good um, because we see that people with PCOS tend to have a defect in their ability to use inositol. So when you correct for that defect, it works the way it should. And we know that inositol plays a role in ovulation and egg quality and menstrual regularity. But as far as the acne, um, we do see the inositol can actually help um, with acne. It's, it has been studied in that aspect. Again, the dairy, so experimenting with cutting back on dairy or switching to full fat and just having a couple servings a day of that or less. Mm -hmm. And zinc, because zinc can help to decrease the testosterone. And if somebody's really struggling um, and they're not trying to get pregnant, there are some medications that can help too uh, to bring down testosterone levels and improve acne. Sure, thank you. Um, so I have one another question on depression uh, on what Lisa was talking about. Uh, and the person says, I suffer from Hashimoto's and PCOS and I have also suffered from eating disorders. I feel like everything, everyone is telling me to remove many foods from my diet and manage the two conditions, but this is affecting my already low mood and mental health. How to navigate this? Yeah, and that's the frustrating thing um, is that 
you know, this, this listener has both the Hashimoto's and an eating disorder. Both are really common in PCOS. Mm -hmm. And, um, the reason I wrote the PCOS workbook is to take a non-diet approach to treating PCOS. And when you take the dieting out of the equation, you're left with focusing on sustainable lifestyle changes. So things that you can focus on is listening to what your body needs, listening to your hunger levels, listening to your fullness levels, listening to what combinations of foods seem to satisfy you and energize you versus what types of combinations of food tend to drag you down and not leave you feeling good or leave you feeling hungrier. Um, The other aspect that we take in the PCOS workbook is to focus on other things other than nutrition, which includes sleep because sleep really affects mood and affects insulin levels. We know stress management is so important for uh, general health and well-being, and can affect insulin too because the stress hormone cortisol really can worsen insulin. So right. working on stress and um, exercise can be really helpful in improving insulin and hormones and mood and fertility too. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, we have uh, at least three and four, three to four questions that we need to answer. So I'll read, um, this is a long one, but the person says, much content published on PCOS is focused on regulating cycles and managing fertility. I am now perimenopausal and past those informational leads now craving for information about how PCOS changes as we age. The strategies that help me lose weight and manage symptoms during childbearing years are no longer working for me. What are some of the challenges PCOS can cause in our mature years and can PCOS disappear with menopause? These are great questions. And we actually have some yeah. really good research now that um, you know, before PCOS was always looked at as a reproductive condition that affected people at childbearing ages. And now uh, we're noticing those people that were studied maybe 20 years ago, they're following up on and studying them now. Mm-hmm. Um, So older people with PCOS, what we're finding is that PCOS does not disappear. Mm, Right. Yeah. If anything, um, hormones. So eventually androgen levels do come down, right? Women tend to go through menopause and menopause androgen levels come down. It takes a little bit longer uh, for those androgen levels to come down than someone that doesn't have PCOS. Um, but they eventually do come down to normal ranges. Um, But what we're also finding is that women with PCOS tend to reach menopause two years later than somebody without PCOS. So they're finding a later menopause um, because of the hormone imbalance. And they're also finding that insulin resistance continues um, into older ages. And that can actually increase the risk for type two diabetes. Right. Mm -hmm. So we almost need more aggressive treatment. Some women might not even be diagnosed until later on in life, even after they have children. Yeah. So you went your whole life, Lisa, not knowing that you had this um, until later. And, you know, a lot of people might have higher glucose levels, higher cholesterol because of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, this should be diagnosed in adolescence and, Uh, the right treatments and supplements need to be started early on to prevent it from getting worse. Knowledge really is power. Um, But we are finding that PCOS does persist post-menopause and that, um, you know, that the insulin resistance, the metabolic aspects can get worse if it's not managed. It doesn't mean everyone's going to get type two diabetes or get high cholesterol or fatty liver, but it just means to be aware of it and maybe a little bit more aggressive treatment is necessary. Absolutely, absolutely, totally agree. Um, um, so, so Angela, we talked about extra hair growth, right? Uh, we have a question about how to manage hair loss. And the person says, I have lost at least 25% of my hair in the last two years. Uh, I already am on metformin and spironolactone. How can I counter these issues? Right, so metformin can actually help a little bit to bring down testosterone. 
spironolactone is a very weak antihypertensive medication. So blood pressure lowering medication, a uh, very weak one that can actually help bring down testosterone. You can't uh, get pregnant on it. It does cause some birth defects. So it's not if you're trying to get pregnant or um, you need to be careful with that, but it does work. It takes a good three months to kick in generally to minimize uh, hair loss. And uh, I'm wondering if the listener is just not taking enough of it because uh, you can go up in the dosage if you can talk to your doctor about doing that. But as far as natural treatment, zinc would be another really good one to try. Um, we also see that saw palmetto does have some research in helping to slow hair loss. Omega threes are really good for that. And um, there's even some procedures, there's one called PLP that they actually do some injections into the scalp to help regrow hair growth. So um, a lot of advancements with that. Right, okay, thank you. Um, one last listener question and then I have one of my own and then we can wind up this talk. So the person asks how to regulate heavy long periods. A lot of PCOS advice is geared towards people with no periods. Yeah, so some people with PCOS, a small percentage, get monthly periods. And sometimes they can be really heavy and associated with blood clots. Um, some people can even become anemic from the heavy blood flow. Uh, so it's important to look at iron levels. Um, sometimes what's causing the heavy periods can be low progesterone. So you can actually talk to your doctor about supplementing with some progesterone, at least like the week leading into your cycle. Um, other signs of the low progesterone could be like sore um, breasts, like tenderness and headaches, mood swings, the PMS or the PMDD is usually aggravated by low progesterone, trouble sleeping. That's another big one um, associated with low progesterone. And some people really find that inositol can help lighten up their periods a little bit too. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Um, uh, so you mentioned about contraindications uh, about, um, I think, sp spironolactone. Uh, what are some, what supplements are contraindicated in women with uh, PCOS who are actually planning pregnancy or, or are already pregnant? Right. So of the ones that we talked about today, I would say not to take berberine um, just because we don't have enough evidence. The evidence that has been um, out there has shown that it is safe. So if someone's trying to get pregnant and they're taking it, I would just recommend stopping it. Right. Um, but we don't have enough information about how it affects pregnancy. Okay. Um, NAC is kind of controversial. You know, if, if you still need it, a lot of people are taking it to get pregnant. Um, but those are the, the big ones. Um, I uh, always recommend a prenatal vitamin if someone is trying to get pregnant or is pregnant. And we even see that vitamin D levels as well as um, omega-3 levels are depleted by the end of pregnancy. So it might be a good idea to still supplement with those too. Right, right. Thank you, Angela. Um, and I, uh, I know you mentioned inositol, um magnesium, zinc, vitamin D, and omega-3s, right? I'm wondering if there is a one pill, which is called a PCOS pill that is available out there for women to take, because these are so many um, <laughs> minerals and vitamins to take, right? There is, there is. And you know what? I did formulate a PCOS multi, it's called. It's a multivitamin and it has extra zinc in oh, it. there is already. Okay. It has vitamin D, it has magnesium, um, it doesn't have fish oil, so you could take it separately or, um, you know, you can e eat more fish, right. but it also has extra B12 in it. And one thing that we didn't talk about is yeah. that people who take oral contraceptives and heartburn medication and metformin, metformin, a big one, it actually depletes levels of B12. Right. Mm -hmm. So anyone taking metformin should really have their levels of B12 checked, their blood tests drawn every year to see what their levels are because a uh, deficiency of B12 can actually be cause some pretty serious uh, permanent damage to nerves and can affect mood too. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Um, 
Uh, one hour is clearly not enough for answering all the questions that we may have about, you know, nutritional management of a condition that is still taking time for even doctors to understand, right? But but I hope we were able to touch upon uh, most of the questions that were asked. And um, thank you so much for finding time to help with all these answers. And I look forward to organizing more such sessions with you um, that will be helpful for, for the PCOS community. Uh, and folks who want to reach out to Angela, you can go on her website pcusnutrition.com and Lisa thank you so much for co-hosting with me today and guiding the panel with your very insightful questions uh, Maddie thanks for sending in your questions and audience um, thanks for your overwhelming response and your great questions I would like to request you all to visit the website pcustracker.app and check out the free PCOS tracker app to see if it's helpful for you to share your daily and monthly um, PCOS symptoms and please share your feedback uh, it is available on both iOS and Google stores for free. And um, we are definitely working to make your tracking experience better and um, your feedbacks will only help us make it more efficient. So send your feedbacks to shweta at shralix.com. And the link for today's show will be sent via email to all the participants. So until next time, thank you everyone. Have a great day and stay safe. Thank you.